All right, let's get started with our lecture for the chapter seven, the Byzantine Empire. So the Byzantine Empire is the continuation of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. You recall that the Western side over here in Western Europe collapses to the thanks to the Germanic invasions. Uh, and those eventually will develop into the European Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. And we'll see eventually kingdoms arise like France and Spain and Italy and England. Uh, but the Eastern Roman Empire was remained intact uh, and eventually it becomes known as the Byzantine Empire. Now the capital of the Byzantine Empire is Constantinople. Uh, and remember Constantine is the one who, who uh, created this capital uh, when the uh, original Roman Empire was split in half. Uh, the Byzantines last for about a thousand years, uh, which is an extremely long time, much longer than the actual original Roman Empire. And part of the reason is because they are the center uh, between Europe and Asia, right? So you see Constantinople right here. Uh, this is Europe, right here is Asia. Uh, so we see that the Byzantines uh, control the all trade, you know, between these two uh, continents. Now, uh, because it's in the middle, that means it's also vulnerable to attack. So you have nomadic people from the steppe, from Central Asian steppe, coming in, uh, you, uh, like the Turks and the Huns. Uh, from the Middle East uh, and from North Africa, we see, eventually we see Muslims come in. Uh, and from Europe, we see Germanic tribes come in and attack as well. Uh, so what we're going to notice is that the Byzantine Empire has this long history of uh, territorial law. So every you know, century they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller in territory. Uh, the government is a theocracy, meaning that the leader is both, the, the emperor is both politically in charge and also in charge of the religion. Uh, he's in fact the head of the church. Now the emperor chooses a, 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 a kind of like an advisor or a top representative called the patriarch, uh, which is Greek for father. And the patriarch uh, runs the church, but he has to listen to whatever the emperor says. And uh, we see uh, th this idea of combining political and religious authority is called Cesaro Papism. Uh, that is a Byzantine kind of like idea uh, or term. Uh, and we see a lot of kind of continuities from the original Roman Empire. So, for example, uh, the Byzantines, they will, um, they will name their emperors or give the title of Caesar, right, which is something that the Romans had done before. Uh, so Christianity is the official religion of the Byzantine Empire, uh, just you know, just like had been at the later Roman Empire, uh, and they named their, their emperor Caesar, just like the Romans, uh, and they were not divine. The emperors were not divine, uh, but they were divinely chosen, right? So they didn't claim to be God or the Son of God, but they believed that God chose them to be the, the representative on earth. Now, one one uh, characteristic that we see of the Byzantine Empire of the authority of the emperor is in images of the courts, right? The emperor normally will sit in a throne that is a considerably higher uh, than everyone else, and the idea was that he's closer to God and therefore higher and better than everyone else, uh, and the center of attention. And uh, the Byzantine Empire would be extremely centralized, it would have a vast bureaucracy uh, where administrators would have to uh, go to college uh, or to get an education to work for the government. All right, one of the greatest and the most only important emperor we need to know about is Emperor Justinian. Uh, here we see him here. That's his wife over there. I know they look very attractive. Uh, but I want you to notice the symbolism of this image, right? Uh, so here we see him with his crown, right? Uh, but notice that there's also a halo going around him. Uh, and again, this is the idea that these people, are, that the emperors are divinely chosen uh, and the political and religious leaders. Uh, Justinian, he wrote uh, what's known as the Code of Justinian, or the Corpus Loris Civilis. Uh, basically, this is uh, all the Roman laws, kind of like refined and reworked and updated. Uh, Justinian took a long time to rewrite all the Roman laws, and basically it's become the laws of the Byzantines, and others, other Europeans will eventually adopt similar laws uh, into the 1800s. Uh, that's his greatest achievement. His other achievement is the expansion of territory. Uh, during his time, he leads the military to conquer, uh, reconquer a lot of the uh, regions that were, you know, originally conquered by the by the Germanic tribes. Uh, so h during his time, Justinian expands the empire. Uh, however, it was super expensive to maintain control of such a vast territory, uh, and a, you know there was a lot of resistance 
uh, from the people living there. They were fighting back, so it wasn't an easy conquest. Uh, therefore, the expansion was short-lived. So here we see, uh, this is the original Byzantine Empire at the time that the Western Empire over here collapsed. Uh, the Eastern Empire uh, was, you know, basically Greece, Turkey, Palestine, and Egypt, right? Uh, during the Justinian's time, this expands, right? You see him conquer more and more area. Uh, but again, this is short-lived because eventually it shrinks back down. Uh, so the idea of Cesaro Papism, all right, that's the big concept of the Byzantines. Uh, the emperor is both Caesar and Patriarch, both Caesar and Pope, basically. Uh, and uh, there is no separation of church and state. So Christianity is the official religion, uh, you know, and uh, everyone had to be Christian, basically, or else to be persecuted. Uh, so they're a theocracy. I mean, we see this image in the photograph. Here's the emperor, right, wearing purple, which is the royal color. He has his crown, he has his halo, right? On one side, you see all the religious leaders. On another side, we see administrators, and we see the military, right? So here we have the political government part, here we have the religious part, and everything is centered right here in the middle on the theocratic emperor. All right, so Christianity uh, continues on, obviously, after the fall of the Roman Empire, and we come up with this concept known as Christendom, right? It was basically all the Christians uh, in the world. So at this time, uh, we have, uh, we'll eventually see two developments of Christianity. Uh, the Catholics, who will be in Western Europe, and the Orthodox, which will be in Eastern Europe. So, uh, again, Christendom is basically all the Christians around the world. But at this time, most of the Christians lived in Europe and around the Mediterranean as well. So, uh, basically, after, after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Christianity continued. Uh, and the problem was that, you know, as Christianity spread throughout different parts of the Mediterranean and Europe, uh, different people came up with different ideas about what the Christian faith is all about. So that eventually, uh, all the church leaders, right, all the major cities like Alexandria and Rome and Constantinople and Jerusalem, uh, they had a, a patriarch, right, like the head priest, and they had to kind of like get together and decide what, you know, what Christianity is all about, what, the, what they really believe in. Uh, so, for example, there was debate as to whether or not Jesus was the Son of God. That was a big debate uh, whether or not uh, Jesus performed miracles, uh, whether or not, you know, what, what stories told about Jesus are true and which ones are false. And so basically uh, what we now know as the New Testament uh, was written somewhere around 300-400 BC, uh, CE. Um, and basically uh, this was kind of like a, a, a meeting uh, of the church leaders to kind of decide what it is that Christians believe in. And over time, we see that uh, the Christian religion kind of shifts or breaks apart, uh, where we have the religious authority in the Pope, right, which is, of course, in Rome. Uh, he is uh, running things on the western half of the you know, former Roman Empire, uh, trying to keep Christianity up and running. Uh, in uh, Western Europe during the Germanic invasions. But on the Eastern side, in the Byzantine side, uh, the, the Bishop of Constantinople will become the head of the church, uh, you know, listening, of course, to the emperor and, um, and being appointed by the emperor. And they will develop the, you know, what we now call the Orthodox uh, or the Greek or the Eastern church. And like I mentioned before, the West will be the Pope, right? So in the East we have the Patriarch, in the West we have the Pope. Now, the, in the West, the reason the Pope kind of gains such, uh, so much authority is because there, there is a lack of political authority. Because we're going to notice that in Western Europe there is a lot of chaos and a lot of violence and invasions. Um, and therefore people, you know, Western Europeans, where Christians look at the Pope as their, not only their spiritual leader, but many times as their political leader because the church is the only kind of like organization that's up and running and protecting people and offering services that no one else is offering, that the governments are not offering. So in the Eastern Empire, because the political stability was present in the Byzantine Empire, uh, we see that the church is you know, under the control of the government. But in the Western half of Europe, in what we now call you know, Western Europe, or what will eventually be known as the Catholic Church, we see that the church will be more independent and much more authority 
uh, than the you know, comparison to the political leadership. So over time, we see that kind of like leadership division, right? The Pope is in Rome, running things for the Western half of Christendom, and the, in Constantinople, the Patriarch and the Byzantine Empire are running things in Eastern um, half of uh, Christendom. And another thing, uh, another cultural difference we'll see is that in the Western side, we have the Latins, right, which is, you know, people, the church spoke Latin. Uh, in the Eastern side, in the Constantinople, we see that they speak Greek. And eventually this leads to what we call the Great Schism, right, which is a division of Christianity or Christendom into these two halves, these two churches, right. Uh, and iconoclasm is part of the reason why. So at one point, one of the emperors in the Byzantines decided that from now on, it, they were not a, the, the Byzantine Christians were not allowed to pray in churches uh, that had images of the saints or of Jesus or of Mary or any other religious leader, or religious figure. Uh, and that is what we call iconoclasm, right, which is banning the use of images. And the idea was that, you know, you're not supposed to pray to an image, you're supposed to pray to a god. But the problem was that the, you know, the Byzantines had been ha using images and icons in their churches and in their uh, art for a very long time, so they, you know, they didn't like it. Uh, and the Pope in Rome, you know, kind of came in and said, um, oh, sorry, the, the Orthodox, the, the emperors told the Pope, in Rome, hey, uh, if we're not using icons anymore, you guys can't use icons anymore because I'm the head of the church. And the Pope said, well, no, I'm really the head of the church, uh, so you can't tell me what to do. And as a result, uh, basically the church, both churches said, uh, you know, that the other church is the false church and that they're teaching the wrong things and that they're, you know, they're not really Christians. Uh, and that's what we call the schism, right? That breaking apart of Christianity between East and West uh, and the Pope will be in charge on one side and the Emperor of the Byzantines will be in charge of the other side along with the Patriarch. And even to this day, Christianity is split between you know, the, uh, the West, the Catholic West, and the Greek East. Uh, there's other you know, kind of like reasons why they broke apart about you know, things like you know, whether or not priests can marry, uh, whether or not you can have religious images, whether or not um, you know, what role Greek philosophy has, stuff like that. Uh, but you know those are minor differences. But we also see, you know, you know, for uh, we also see uh, the development of architecture uh, play a role. So, for example, this would be a Catholic cathedral, right, of the Middle Ages. Uh, this would be a Byzantine uh, Orthodox church. Uh, uh, this would be inside one of the cathedrals. Right? Of course, we see these stained glass windows. Uh, well, here in the Orthodox Church, we see a lot of paintings. Obviously, uh, the whole banning of icons did not last very long, uh, and uh, icons be, you know, remain a major part of the Orthodox faith. All right, so that's it for part one. I'll see you next.